This is Chapter 6 of The Judgment by Terry Daniels. If you haven't heard the story from the beginning, please return to the main channel and listen to the chapters from there. Please like and subscribe. If you wish to continue, please note that there are some scenes and violence that some may find offensive. The Judgment by Terry Daniels Chapter 6 The Courtroom After the boy had finished speaking, the courtroom sat silent for a brief moment. All his words seemed to hang in the air before being burst like bubbles by Jenny's voice over the video link. Well, that's about all from Eddie at the moment, so well done, Eddie. I hope you all heard him in full. I have had a word with him concerning whether or not he would answer any questions concerning this statement, so we could put it across to you, and he is willing to try. Isn't that right, Eddie? The image of the boy from the video screen nodded his head. He seemed very relaxed, yet it was quite clear that there was moisture around his eyes from recounting the story. Again, the voice of the unseen Jenny crackled over the screen. If there are any questions from the court? There was a subtle and comical look at each other as each side decided on who was to go first. Mr Lewis rose up from his chair and with an approving nod from the judge spoke to the screen. Hi Jenny, it's Dan Lewis here. Can you hear me? He looked at the image of the boy on the screen, who seemed slightly lost. Yes, I can, Dan. We can both hear you fine. Just a quick question for you first, Jenny, if I may, as this concerns what happened afterwards. OK, go ahead, replied the voice from the screen. Thank you, said Lewis, and scratched his chin. He felt a small cut from his shave this morning, and made a mental note to convert over to an electric razor. We heard from the statement that the clothes and possessions of the abuser were disposed of and the kitchen cleaned up. Was there anything that was missed? And what was the mother's reaction to finding this man gone without a buy or leave that morning? Didn't she think that was strange? I can answer those for you without having to consult Eddie here, since we've discussed this earlier before we came on air, replied Jenny. It appears that, unbeknownst to Eddie... The abuser had left his wallet on the bedside table, next to where his mother was sleeping. The wallet contained mostly receipts from the man's business, but also, interestingly, £50 in cash. If this amount was destined to be paid to the mother, then we will never know, as they never heard from him again. What about the police? Surely either the attack on the boy or the bodily harm to the man would have been reported in some context by either party? There came a cynical chuckle from Jenny's voice. Uh, apparently not, she replied. The abuser, Charlie, never came back to the house, nor did he file a complaint against Eddie or his mother. As there were offences on both sides and nothing was reported, it appears that, in a strange kind of way, both sides legally got away with it, as it were, although I know Eddie here is still having a few problems at school. Lewis looked towards his colleague before speaking again. Hmm, I see. So what of the boy's mother then? What was her reaction? Her comment to Eddie on that morning in question was to utter the words, Goodbye to old rubbish. And with that they carried on with their Saturday routine as usual. But she is aware of this incident now. Is she there to speak to? Lewis looked at the screen and waited for an answer. For a moment it appeared that they had been cut off with the sound. Then the face of Jenny appeared on the screen as she peered into the lens. I'm afraid that although the mother is present in another room, there are doubts about her mental capacity to answer any questions as she is currently inebriated. Therefore she is still unaware of the incident we are discussing and Eddie has insisted that remains the case. Why is that, Jenny? Lewis watched her look over her shoulder at the boy and nod her head. 
it would complicate matters. I believe that their home life is fragile at best, and this information would cause his mother to slide into a deeper depressive state and ultimately would involve child services. Eddie believes it may even kill her. He is running the household as before and juggling his schoolwork with his home life to a satisfactory state for the current time. Are you satisfied with that situation, Jenny? Speaking as a child counsellor, asked Lewis. Jenny gave a wry smile. I believe the boy has gone through quite an experience and yet he is coping with this arrangement because there is no father figure and he has taken it upon himself to protect his mother. So in answer to your question, Dan, yes, I am currently satisfied. This incident occurred a few months ago, so there has been no deterioration of home life or mental ability. Eddie is here and is quite ready to answer any further questions you have. With that, her face again disappeared from view, and the screen again filled with the image of the boy who was staring into the camera. Hello, Eddie, said Lewis. Hello, mumbled the boy. There seemed to be a bright fire in his eyes. Can I ask you a few questions? Eddie nodded his head carefully. That's good, thank you. I just want to start by asking you how you are at the moment. You've been through quite a harrowing experience? I'm okay, I guess, replied Eddie gently. Mum hasn't seen anyone since, so it's just been me and her. I like things as they are. Charlie scared me a bit, but things are fine now. Is your mum all right? Is she able to do any things around the house? Mum doesn't need to do anything. She finds everything a bit of a struggle, but we manage. I would like her to stop drinking sometime, but it makes her happy, so that's okay too. She's my mum. Lewis looked at the screen and into the eyes of the child. They were moistened around the edges, but there was a steel determination radiating from them like a solid wall. He admired this boy, but also felt a pang of sympathy. It was not usual practice to feel too involved with a witness, but Lewis liked this boy and his determination. And what about school, Eddie? Are you managing to get on with your teachers and friends? Teachers are okay. Now Mum doesn't have any boyfriends round, I can get my homework done in the evening once she's fallen asleep. I... I don't have too many friends at school. I don't hang around with anyone because I need to get home, so my Python mates don't ask to tag along anymore. It doesn't bother me. They all seem a bit childish. Only Tom seems to understand me. He doesn't ask about my mum and knows a bit about my home life, so we tend to meet up in the park when my mum is settled. Lewis looked at his notes before replying. Would this be Thomas Cooper? Yeah, uh, we're good friends. Does he know about this incident we have discussed? Eddie paused before answering. I told him I, I never give him all the facts, especially about the bastard's hands touching me, but he laughed when he heard about the screwdriver. Do you trust him? He's my best friend. I promised he wouldn't tell anyone else. Suddenly there was panic in his eyes. No one's going to take my mum away, are they? We are not here for that, Eddie, replied the judge quickly. This hearing is just to assess certain incidents affecting your life. We have no authority to change your circumstances, just to evaluate the events. Please be assured of that. Have you any further questions, Mr Lewis? No more, Your Honour, replied Lewis and looked at the screen again. Thank you, Eddie. You have been very cooperative and helpful. With a click of the remote, the TV screen shrunk the image into a small white dot and then was completely blank. The courtroom became quiet. So what of this Thomas Cooper boy? asked the judge. Is there any further relevance to his involvement? Not at present, although please be aware that this name will be relevant in terrible circumstances later on. As for now, I believe we have all the information we need at this stage. Lewis looked at the judge, who nodded his head. Good, 
I am never keen on the video link. So impersonal. Can't see the whites of their eyes. If all agreed, shall we continue? We do have a lot to get through. Lewis looked over towards his colleague. They were used to the system and had worked together for many years. They may have been on either side of the court, but their understanding of each other went back to when they had first met. Having both trained in the same law school, they had become very firm friends early on. Connor made him laugh. They shared a love of Roman architecture and had booked a trip together during the final summer holidays to visit the iconic Italian city to explore and to tick off the sights in their itinerary brochure. It became a game between them to test each other's knowledge on each particular building during their stay. There were rumours at the time that they were a gay couple who were very much in love. Although this was very preposterous, both men also found they shared the same taste in women, thin, blonde and preferably wearing tight denim shorts. They decided one day whilst exploring the city to get into their rumoured characters and take some photos of them holding each other's hands and posing seductively over each other. These were then purposely posted onto a few notice boards in the law school. What surprised them most was the acceptance of this relationship among their fellow students. This was even more apparent as many of the female classmates decided to look elsewhere for male relationships and both Connor and Lewis agreed the jest had backfired somewhat. In the eyes of all the other students and many of the teachers, they were now a gay couple for the duration of the academic year. The friendship, though, if anything, became stronger and they decided that if a law career was to be the future, then they would do it together. Three months out of school and both with qualifications in hand, the opportunity came up. Although, strictly speaking, they were sometimes to be classed as defence and prosecution and were to sit either side of the court, their roles would be considered joint. Each would take turns in questioning the witnesses. This court was different from any other. Each witness would be assessed and their story told with honesty. It was up to both men to ascertain the truth and character and would work with the judge in formulating the verdict. The sentence would be passed and then they were finished for the day. No jury, no public gallery or press box. No months of laborious trial dragging on day after day. Every witness turned up. Even the notes concerning the day would be prepared and waiting for both men when they showed up each morning. Each hearing took one day and the summarisation and verdict were passed before they left. Each day was a different hearing. It was easy work. Rewarding work. It also allowed Connor and Lewis to go over the day in the law building's bar afterwards. There they could drink beer and run through the events of the day. They could also discuss their love of all things Roman. They had returned to Italy only one more time since law school and their gay adventure. This time they had travelled to Pompeii as a breather shortly after the last exams and during their stay of the ruins they had been involved in a scary moment on one of the assigned boat trips around the site area when the small craft they were travelling on had collided into a tourist ship. There were only around a dozen people on board with them and the rescue was swift. A lifeboat was organised by the Italian authorities almost instantly and despite being in the water of the Gulf of Naples for a matter of minutes, both Connor and Lewis were pulled to safety. Both men even managed to laugh about it. There was a lot of fuss at the time and a lot of wailing and crying from the other passengers on the board the boat, but to both men it seemed to be a great deal of fuss over nothing. Being law students, the first reaction was to sue the arse off them. But it was on their return to England a few days later that they were each contacted separately by a law practice that had been notified by the Italian authorities. The caller had wanted to confirm that no legal claim was to be made and after being told a resolute no by both men had offered both Connor and Lewis a position working together in this court. Never looking a gift horse in the mouth, both had said yes and were informed that they could start on the following Monday. When Connor, the most sceptical of the pair, had asked if there was to be an interview, 
He was told it wasn't necessary and their high grades were all that were needed to begin a four-week trial period. That had been over three years ago and they had both worked in harmony ever since. There had been no further returns to the heart of the Roman Empire as each week was a full and busy week and besides, Lewis had now felt he had been there, done that and bought the T-shirt. As Lewis looked over towards Connor, his friend was already looking back. Lewis knew the next stage and already had the notes in front of him. This was where he liked to be in the day's proceedings. He agreed with the judge that video interviews were all very well, but an actual witness standing in the witness box gave him the edge he needed to stare into their eyes and get the maximum potential out of each person. It was true that he had brought many witnesses to tears as they recounted their stories, but he never felt pity. The facts were all important to every case, and he felt as though he could sniff out any deceit or misinformation simply by looking deep into their eyes. All truth was only skin deep in his opinion, and although he hated the good cop, bad cop terminology, he reckoned that between Connor and himself, they could extract all the information they needed. He never got involved emotionally in any of the statements. This would cloud his judgment. He never liked to be deceived or proved wrong, and this competitive edge made sure he wasn't bamboozled by tears or sobs as the truth seeped out of each witness like sap from a tree. Connor stood up and Lewis sat down. It was so synchronised they could have set it to music. With his notes in one hand, he spoke to the court. Please bring in the witness. There was a shuffling sound, and from behind the open doorway leading onto the witness stand, strolled in a tall, almost gangly lad. His hair was jet black and cut to a rebellious length. As he took to the stand, Connor thought he gave off an air of confidence that youth was so renowned for. The boy wore slightly scruffy black straight trousers and a black t-shirt with a stark white image of an automatic rifle with the message, Guns are God, clearly printed underneath. His thin arms stuck out of the shirt like twigs off a tree in a Wurzel Gummidge scarecrow caricature. The boy ignored the wooden chair positioned by the stand and placed himself behind the witness box. He looked left and right, then seeing the judge watching him, rewarded him with a crafty wink of the eye and a crooked half-smile. Connor watched this behaviour with amusement. He was going to enjoy this one. Am I told that you are to be addressed as Z? Is that correct? Connor asked and waited while the boy turned his head to look at him. The eyes shone brightly back at him. If you like, replied the boy. Lewis moved round to face him directly and stared at him. So why is that then, Zed? Is that a nickname? Is it short for something? Zed half cocked his head as if baffled that he didn't know. It's like the puppet, he replied. On the telly? Connor raised his eyebrows. You mean Zebedee from the Magic Roundabout? Well, yeah, said Zed but it got shortened, a bit of a mouthful otherwise. Plus, I was always coming last in class, if you know what I mean. Yes, he replied, that's um, very clever. Connor took a quick glance at his notes as if to say, I will know if you are lying, and asked the first proper question. How old are you, Zed? The boy almost instinctively straightened up his posture in a vain attempt to appear older. Now he looked thinner than ever. Sixteen, seventeen next month, he replied. Is that what's written on your notepad then? The lawyer threw him a commanding smile. Are you aware as to why you are here, Zed? he asked. The incident with the car? It wasn't my fault. I thought I'd already gone through that with the other lot. 
<laughs> the car we will get to, continued Connor. But I would like to begin by talking to you about the incident at school last year, if I may. Again, he looked at Zed straight in the eyes without blinking. It was a trick he had learnt which demonstrated who was in charge. First one to blink loses. You know that you are here to give evidence under oath. Right. And what you tell the court hearing today in front of my learned colleagues will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, interrupted Zed. Yeah, I get it. I've seen the TV programmes on the box. Connor exhaled an annoying sigh. You are aware this is not a court of law, Zed, like on the box. He quoted the phrase in the air with his fingers. You will notice there is no Bible to swear on to and no jury. This is a hearing and the conclusion will have the most dramatic consequences should you decide to deceive this court by lying or telling untruths. Zed smirked. Aren't they the same thing? Connor was beginning to get fed up with the boy's sarcastic tones. He raised his voice a notch. Do you understand, Zed? It's a simple question. Yeah, I'll get it. Still the same defiant tone. He would have to step this up. My name is Mr Connor and I am here with Mr Lewis over to my left. We are here to help you. You will answer all questions clearly to either me, Mr Lewis or the judge, should he wish to intervene. We are going to talk over two incidents involving yourself in your recent past. The purpose is not to highlight any wondrous achievements or events that have added purpose to the lives of others, but simply to concentrate on the bad events or poor life decisions that you have made. It all sounds unfair, I know, but what we are about to discuss will filter out those parts which we all feel were simply part of your learning process. The serial killer from the accidental murder, for example. He looked across at Zed and saw that he had his complete attention. It was a good start. Connor began to walk slowly across the room and back again, like a nonchalant policeman guarding a doorway. You are to answer all questions truthfully and without deception. It is imperative that you do not try to lie or leave anything out, but to answer honestly and as truthfully as you can remember. If there are any difficulties with any information, then you must ask. Do not guess, Zed. These incidents are in your recent past, and information is already available here on these files that I hold in my hand. However, the truth can only be spoken by you and you alone. He paused for dramatic effect. Is everything clear so far, Zed? Yes came the answer. That's very good, so... Connor flipped up to the first page on his notepad. He was starting to enjoy himself. Incident one is the situation concerning some live ammunition. I believe this was sometime last year and at your school. Is that correct, Zed? The answer was again in the affirmative. For the benefit of this hearing, then, can you please tell me, in your own words... What happened on that day? He watched as the boy shuffled slightly behind the stand and then took a deep breath. I was walking to school as usual but ran in a bit late on account of me sleeping in. The alarm clock hadn't been wound up and I'd been a bit late the night before. I like to listen to the radio, see? It's that Radio 1 DJ that likes to play the punk and new wave stuff. It kind of beats all that happy, long-haired, hippie rubbish that the other radio stations play, only it don't start until about ten o'clock at night. Bit unfair if you ask me. It's not as if anyone... Mr Connor, interrupted the judge in a sharp tone. Is this relevant to the story? Do I or anyone in this room need to know his nighttime activities? Connor looked to the judge and snapped immediately into a reply. Indeed, sir. He turned back to the boy. Zed, can you please concentrate on recounting your walk to school? Zed shrugged his shoulders and continued. 
Well, it, it was like I said. I was on my way to school and running late. But I always keep my head down, see, in case somebody's dropped any money. You do see the odd pound note sometimes. Anyway, I noticed a small brown box lying in the road next to the curb. The box was slightly damp and there was no dog muck on it, so I kind of picked it up and kept going without thinking about it. If I was late again, then Mr Palmer... This would be Mr Palmer your year head, asked Connor. Yeah, him, continued Zed. Well, he would give me detention and keep me back after school. I couldn't do that, as my mum's not very well again and I ain't got no dad. So she would be worried and I couldn't let her down. She's poorly enough as it is, see? So did you make it in time? Zed blew out some air from his thin lips. Just, me. He was going to close the gate. I like Mr Palmer, though. He's also my science teacher and he lets me fix things for him so I can see how they work. Anyway, I didn't get a chance to look at the box I'd picked up earlier from the road until break time. And then me and my mate Tommy, we opened it together. This would be your friend Thomas Cooper? Yeah, he's my best mate. Well, he's not around any more, but he still was. I don't get on with many of the others. That's another reason why they nicknamed me Zed, on account of they think I bounce around and act weird. Like this television show you spoke of, this magic roundabout. Zed nodded his head enthusiastically. He was beginning to talk a little faster now. Oh, I don't mind. I kind of like it. It means they all leave me alone, uh, apart from Tommy. He sees, saw, uh, things the way I do. Did. The lawyer noticed a hesitancy in the boy's voice. He was beginning to lose his thread. We will talk about Tommy in detail a little later, Zed, said Connor. Let's get back to this box you found. The boy shook his head as though out of a trance and continued. So anyway, break time came and we both went to my locker and took the box into a quiet room that I knew wasn't being used and once we knew we were on our own, we opened it. And what did you find? asked Connor. Bullets, replied Zed. Rifle bullets. A whole full box. We couldn't believe it. I mean, I know a lot about rifles and stuff. I've watched all the war films, but there must have been loads of them. Zed gestured with his fingers. About this big? They were shiny. I thought they must have been blanks or fakes or something. So what did you do? asked Connor. Did you take them to the headmaster or this Mr Palmer? No way, replied Zed, shaking his head. Why would they believe me about finding them in the road? I would only get into trouble, as I said before, my mum. I couldn't be kept in after school. Do, do you know what I mean? OK, said Connor. Tommy said he knew how to test one of them to see if they were real, but we had to wait until last lesson for that. The lawyer frowned slightly. The last lesson? Why was that? It's basically a reading lesson, said Zed. Me and him always sit together and there's a temporary classroom that we use away from the main school. It was only supposed to have been used while they did some building on the main one, but it's been there forever, apparently. Some of the wood around the windows has started to rot, so it gets a bit cold. The teachers hate using it. Tommy wanted an audience. He was very popular and was liked a lot more than me, although we stuck together in class. He wanted to show off and knew how to do it, so we took about three or four each of the bullets and stuck them in our blazers to wear at this lesson. It was cold that day, so the teacher tended not to hang about once we were settled and all sat at our desks. We were just left alone as a class and we all pretty much agreed that if we were quiet enough, then the class wouldn't be disturbed until the bell went. That way we got to go straight away and the teacher spent his last lesson smoking somewhere or having a quick drink. How do you know that was true, Zed? asked Connor. It was obvious, really, answered Zed. You could smell it. Most of the teachers thought we didn't know, but I did. Same smell as what my mum smells of sometimes. Did you tell anyone else of your find? Tommy wanted it to be a big surprise, so he said to keep it to ourselves. He said it would only take one of them, but we had better bring a few in case it never worked first time. He seemed very sure it would. 
His granddad told him, apparently, he was in the war. So what happened next, Zed? The teacher left after we had all settled into the reading. We knew that he would, lazy bastard. So we knew it was safe from then on. Tommy, he was such an entertainer, went to the front of the class and announced that we, me and him that is, had an experiment to perform. That got their attention. His idea, as his granddad told him, was that if you position the bullet carefully on the floor next to the door frame, then you slam it, the door will hit the side of the shell and bam! Zed raised his arms out wide excitedly like a child finding a ton of confectionery. He looked to both of the men out front, nodding his head excitedly. Connor could tell the boy was enjoying the telling of his story. Did it work? he asked. Zed shook his head. No. It made a bloody noise and the frame had a small dent, but no, it didn't go off. We could hear sniggers from some of the cockier boys. I felt a bit embarrassed. Someone even called us a pair of wankers. But it didn't work, not the first time anyway. Tommy wasn't worried. He was a typical showman, just said that was a rehearsal or something to simply whet their appetite. It just needed a small adjustment, the angle or something. So we tried again straight away. We thought it best to try a fresh one. So the second bullet, Connor watched as the eyes of the boy suddenly opened wide, showing a chasm of dark pupil. It went off. Went off like a, well, like a bullet. It was incredible, the noise and the smoke. I I've read loads of magazines about the cordite smell that came from the shell, but to actually experience it... So where did the bullet head go? One of the other boys was pointing to the wall on the other side of the class. Me and Tommy went over and there it was, the tip of the bullet. It had dug itself into the wood on the other side of the classroom. It was amazing. Connor furrowed his eyebrows. So, despite the noise and the loud bang and the smell, no teacher came in? Zed gave back a small smile. No, like I said, we were away from the main building and everyone was too shocked to cheer. They were all staring at me and Tommy. It was brilliant. We felt like rock stars or something. Then someone shouted, do it again. And did you? Did you and Tommy do it again? Suddenly Zed's face became serious. I was scared. I was thinking if any teacher came running in, then we, we would be up at the headmaster. I wouldn't be going home on time that night. And my mum. But another bullet was set off, wasn't it? Pressed Connor. Yeah, the whole class was so impressed it was like going to be like an encore. So the bullet was set up again and the door was slammed again. Is that correct? Yes, sir. There it was. The boy had called him Sir. Connor noticed a slight shift in the boy's attitude. He knew he was telling the truth. He pressed on. Only this time? Only this time the bullet must have been at a different angle or something. What happened, Zed? asked the lawyer softly. There was the same loud bang, continued Zed, the same puff of smoke, only we heard a cry. Who from? Zed swallowed hard. His lips were drying up. It hit one of the other kids at the front of the class on the opposite side. He was one of the geeky ones, I suppose you'd call him. He wasn't really watching, didn't want to get involved with it. But he was crying. What happened? Zed looked ahead at the man in front of him. Can I have a, a glass of water, please? In a minute, replied Connor. Why was he crying? The bullet had gone off all right, but it hadn't landed in the same place as the first one. It, it went into this boy's foot, straight through his shoe. That's why he was crying. I didn't know what to do. I remember thinking to myself, how was I supposed to get away with this now? He was crying quietly, like a whimper, and it seemed as though it was going to be all right. Maybe he had missed his toes or something. Oh, I don't know. Then some other kid pointed to the blood on the floor next to his toe and he just started to wail. I mean, really cry. One of the others went out of the door and said he was going to find a teacher. Me and Tommy should go with him, to tell the truth, I suppose. What else could we do? 
the teacher was found. He was. I went with the other classmate and Tommy stayed to look after the boy. Tommy seemed fascinated by the pool of blood on the floor. He was actually smiling. Someone else was being sick in one of the desks, but most of the class just sat there in their seats, like a flock of sheep, wondering what to do next. Connor went to his desk and poured a glass of water. He approached the stand and handed it to Zed, who took it gratefully and drank the contents in one go. You explained everything to the teacher? I had to, wanted to, continued the boy as he wiped his lips. They asked me where the bullets had come from. I took them back to my locker and handed them the rest of the box. I also gave them the other few in my blazer. They wanted to know how many were missing. I said I didn't know. I was close to tears myself. I knew I was in deep trouble. What happened to the unfortunate boy with a bullet wound? He was taken to hospital. Had a toe removed, someone told me. Tommy and me were escorted to the headmaster. The police were called and each of us was taken home. I'd never been in a police car before. Tommy seemed not to care, said to me just before we separated that his parents were going to be all right about it. He was wrong. They weren't all right. His dad gave Tommy a hiding after the police had left his house. And your mother? What did she say when you returned home in the police car? Connor noticed that Zed had begun to slow down with the speech. He guessed the excitement of the story was nearly over. The boy was an intelligent lad and knew there was no point in lying. When we got to my house, continued Zed, she wasn't even awake. I had to wake her up from the sofa while the policeman waited near the door. The room was a bit messy. I don't think she'd been out of that room since I'd left for school. The policeman told her the situation, but I don't think she took it in. She wasn't very well. They could see that. So they left me and her alone without another word and said the school would be dealing with me. Zed paused and took a deep breath. I got suspended. Two weeks. Mum was overjoyed, said I could now take care of her all day. Said to me it would be like a holiday for us, just the two of us. Zed smiled at the memory. Connor saw the smile and glared at him until he stopped. This is no laughing matter, young man. Please remember where you are. So you are saying she never punished you, grounded you, no TV, anything? It's just me and my mum, said the boy. I hardly ever go out, and apart from a few game shows, we don't watch TV. I'd rather be messing about with electric stuff, but she don't know that because she never comes to my room. There was a polite cough from the other side of the room, and both Connor and Zed looked over at the same time. Mr Lewis had risen from his chair. If I may ask a few questions at this stage, Your Honour, he asked. The judge looked to Connor, who shrugged, nodded, and gestured to Mr Lewis to come forward. Mr Lewis, said the judge, the floor is yours. Lewis turned to face his colleague and gave a slight wink to his friend, who sat back down. Good cop, bad cop. He then turned and smiled at the boy. Quite an interesting story, Zed. You have told it very well. Just a few pointers to ponder over. I believe your answers to be very important to this outcome, so again, please reply as honestly as you can. Uh, yes, sir. Again with the sir. Excellent. You tell of finding this box of ammunition on a public highway in full view of anyone should they walk by. A very rare occurrence, I think you will agree. Do you think they could have been collected or picked up by anyone before you came along? I was looking down at the pavement, answers Zed. I always do, it's a habit of mine. I just saw them and they were under some leaves half covered, so I suppose not everyone would have seen them. Would you have done? Lewis gave him a sharp look. Please don't ask me any questions, Zed. Just to reiterate, the information that you give today is what is most important. I have a statement record here from a Captain Donaldson from the 4th Territorial Brigade. He flipped a page over on his notepad. He is based in your local area and was informed that a box of small rifle ammunition was indeed lost on a recent recce. 
whilst travelling through the town. It was completely unnoticed and unaccounted for until the police contacted him to report that a box had been found. He was, quite understandably, embarrassed by the discovery and was keen to have them back into his possession. He did go on to say that it was a very serious omission and reiterated the danger should a box such as these fall into the wrong hands. Do you understand this, Zed? Yes, sir. So explain why you failed to contact the police immediately. Lewis stared at the boy and waited. It was almost as if the boy was thinking it over in his mind. Oh, I don't know, he finally answered. You don't know? My mum, Lewis emitted a loud tut and threw up his arms. Your mother. Surely, Zed, you cannot blame this on the health of your mother. You are hardly a child clutching to her apron strings. Connor rose from the other side. This was a well-played act between the two of them. Surely, Your Honour, interrupted Connor. It was stated earlier that the boy was running late for school after caring for his mother and did not want to be detained afterwards because of being late. Oh, come on, proclaimed Lewis loudly and gave his friend and colleague a smile. Zed is a strapping 16-year-old lad. He can look after himself. You can't believe the sympathy cards, surely. He's playing with us here, isn't he? Connor looked at his friend. Give the boy some slack. His mum is not very well. It seems like he's almost her carer. Both men looked in the judge's direction. His face was neutral. Mr Lewis, asked the judge. He shrugged his shoulders. Very well, he said, and turned his attention back to the stand. Was this also the reason why you didn't report the findings when you arrived at the school then? Because of the trouble you may find yourself in? Yes, sir, came the solemn reply. Hmm, very convenient, although that doesn't explain why you set off two bullets in the classroom by this act of door slamming, does it? It was Tommy's idea. But you never visualised the danger. Live ammunition. You've already stated here that you watch a lot of war films. Uh, no, sir. Zed hesitated slightly and swallowed loudly again. It, it seemed like a laugh. <laughs> a laugh? Lewis chuckled sarcastically. Please, how can this act of violent behaviour be classed as a laugh? I... Who slammed the door, Zed? demanded Lewis, raising his voice. Connor spoke again. The good cop, bad cop routine was well rehearsed to intimidate any overconfident witness. Mr Lewis, you are being a tad harsh with the boy. This cocky little juvenile is not worth the shit from my shoe, Mr Connor. Please do not interfere. He glared at his friend, but the boy could not see the play in his eyes. I shall ask you again. Who slammed the door? The one responsible for hospitalising a fellow pupil. We both did, replied the boy slowly. Tommy and me did, did one each. Who slammed the door on the second bullet? Lewis shouted at the boy and pointed his finger accusingly. I'm not talking about the one that went harmlessly into the woodwork. I'm referring to the one that maimed one of your school colleagues who will now go through the rest of his life with a disabled foot. The one bullet that could have so easily fatally wounded someone and which, quite frankly, would never have happened had you informed the school on your arrival of your discovery. So, without jerking me around... I will ask one more time. Who was responsible for the second door slam, Zed? Tommy, blurted out the boy. Because the first went into the wall, he wanted to do it. He wanted to be the one who got the bullet to go through a window or something. We, we didn't think. Are you sure this is correct, Zed? Only, as we will find out later, we are unable to interview Tommy to verify this. Your word must be the truth. Is this the truth, or are you pulling my plonker to save your sorry ass? Mr Lewis, please, interrupted the judge. There will be no foul language. 
Lewis looked at the judge and acknowledged the statement with a small, apologetic wave. Instantly, he turned back towards Zed. Captain Donaldson also went on to say that the quantity of bullets inside a brand new box was different from the total that was returned to him by the police. It records here that despite the two that were fired and you returning some from your blazer, a total of three bullets were still unaccounted for. Can you explain? The boy remained quiet for a brief moment. Do you need another glass of water, Zed? I can ask Mr Connor to get that for you. The boy shook his head. Then please answer the question. I put some in my blazer and gave Tommy a few, said the boy finally. But I did give mine back after what happened. I promise you that's what I did. Maybe Tommy. Ah yes, maybe Tommy. Very easy to blame something on someone who isn't here, which I believe takes us nicely into the second of our incidents. Shall I continue, Mr Connor? His colleague nodded and with a small gesture of his hand allowed him the floor. They had done this routine many times over the years with many different kind of witnesses. They had each taken turns to be the bad man. It varied things up a little. Sometimes the witness would shout back or burst into tears. Both men didn't care either way, as long as the truth was spoken. Connor watched his colleague face the boy again. I refer you, Zed, to the car accident with the vehicle stolen from your neighbour's garage. This occurred on the 28th of July of this year. Can this jog your memory? Can you recall this incident? Zed looked at the man with an incredulous look. Do I recall? Of course I recall. Pardon my slight sarcastic approach, said Lewis with his palms outstretched. This is not a game of deception. I'm only trying to record the truth via a statement. Its importance, as you now know, is paramount. I don't want to intimidate you, Zed. We are only trying to record the events and maintain the facts. He watched the boy. This was a big moment in the witness stand. It appeared that the confidence had vanished. He decided to tread carefully. Could you, therefore, Zed, confirm your involvement in this accident? Yes, came the reply. Please then explain, in your own words, what happened on that day. 